She built a multi-billion dollar company on a web of lies and deception. She engineered the entire media narrative around her business and used multiple legal tactics to manipulate her own investors and employees. This is the story of Elizabeth Holmes, the former CEO of Theranos. Once a Silicon Valley darling, today she's preparing to serve an 11 year sentence for fraud. In this video, we're gonna go through the business and legal tactics that Elizabeth Holmes used to maintain control of her business and manipulate those around her. From the very beginning of Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes recognized the power of the media in shaping public perception. She knew that if she could control the narrative around her company, she could influence investors, partners, and even potential employees to buy into her vision. One of the first things that Holmes did to establish her media presence was to carefully curate a personal brand. She was known for a distinctive black turtleneck, which she wore at almost all public appearances, and this helped her create a recognizable and consistent image that made her easily identifiable and memorable, not to mention the constant comparisons to Steve Jobs. In addition to her personal branding efforts, Holmes worked hard to cultivate relationships with high-profile journalists and media outlets. She knew that having key influencers on her side would give her greater control over the flow of information about her company. To that end, Holmes and her team spent a great deal of time and resources courting reporters, inviting them to exclusive events, and even flying them out to Theranos headquarters in Palo Alto. By establishing these relationships, Holmes was able to shape the narrative around Theranos in a way that was favorable to her company. But it wasn't just building positive relationships with journalists. Holmes was also known for her aggressive tactics when it came to negative press. She wasn't afraid to use her power to retaliate against journalists who wrote unflattering stories about her company. In some cases, Holmes and her team would go so far as to blacklist reporters, making it difficult for them to get access to sources within Theranos. This had a chilling effect on investigative journalism around the company. Reporters who wanted to maintain a good relationship with Theranos were less likely to pursue negative stories. Holmes also knew the power of social media in shaping public opinion. She and her team were active on platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn, where they would post positive stories about Theranos and engage with followers. This created a perception of a vibrant and growing company, which helped attract even more investors, partners, and employees. In short, Elizabeth Holmes was able to control the media and shape the narrative around Theranos through a combination of personal branding, relationship building with journalists, aggressive tactics against negative press, and a savvy use of social media. Another tactic that Holmes employed was the use of non-disclosure agreements. She required all employees to sign NDAs which prevented them from speaking about the company's inner workings. This made it incredibly difficult for journalists and investigators to uncover the truth about Theranos, as the people who knew the most about what was going on were unable to speak out. Non-disclosure agreements, or NDAs for short, are legal agreements between two or more parties that prohibit the sharing of certain confidential information. These agreements are often used in business settings to protect sensitive information such as trade secrets or customer data. In the case of Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes required all employees to sign NDAs as a condition of their employment. This meant everyone who worked for the company was legally bound to keep all information about the company confidential and not to share any details about the company's private inner workings. On the surface, this might seem like a reasonable measure to protect the company's intellectual property. However, in practice, the use of NDAs made it incredibly difficult for anybody to learn what was going on inside of Theranos. Because employees were legally bound not to discuss certain aspects of the company with anyone outside of Theranos, journalists who wanted to report on the company's activities were unable to find any sources that would speak to them. This made investigative journalism into the company's real technology and business practices nearly impossible. In addition to making it difficult for journalists to get information, the NDAs also had a chilling effect on the employees because she had no problem threatening them with legal consequences if they violated their NDAs. As a result, the use of the NDAs was a very powerful tool that Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos leveraged to control the narrative around the company. By keeping their employees silent, they were able to maintain the illusion of a successful and innovative company, even as questions about the effectiveness of their technology and business practices began to surface. It wasn't until after the downfall of Theranos that the true extent of the company's deception was revealed, and this was because more former employees began to speak out because they no longer had to fear the NDAs and the legal consequences that would arise from breaching them. Another legal tactic used by Elizabeth Holmes was a dual class stock structure. This allowed her to maintain control of the board of directors at Theranos, even as the company continued to raise funds and add new shareholders. In December of 2013, 
as the company was about to raise another round of funding, which would potentially dilute her shares to the point where she wouldn't control the company, Theranos sent a shareholder letter asking investors to consent to the creation of two classes of common stock. Class A common stock would receive one vote per share, and Class B common stock would receive 100 votes per share. Obviously, Elizabeth Holmes moved all of her Class A to Class B, giving her 100 times more votes than she did before. This move protected Holmes' voting control of the company and made it easier for her to push forward with her vision of the company, even in the face of opposition from other shareholders and board members. The use of a dual-class stock structure like this is very controversial in business. While it can be a great way for founders to maintain control of the company and protect their vision, it can also lead to a concentration of power, which is not in the best interest of the company or its shareholders. In the case of Theranos, the use of a dual-class stock structure gave Elizabeth Holmes unchallengeable control over the company. As a majority voter, she was able to control the board of directors and make key decisions without being accountable to anyone. Even if the board wanted to fire her as CEO, she had the power to preemptively fire the entire board of directors. This concentration of power was a red flag for many investors as it weakened corporate governance and made it difficult for other shareholders to have a say in the company's operations or strategy. This strategy of using a dual class share structure became popular in Silicon Valley amongst founders because of Mark Zuckerberg, but the situation at Theranos was still very extreme. Mark Zuckerberg's use of Class B shares at Facebook gave him 10 votes to every vote of the Class A shareholders. This is significantly less than the 100 to 1 votes that Holmes had. Zuckerberg also didn't have more than 50% of the vote based solely on his own shares. Instead, he entered into voting agreements with other shareholders, which allowed him to vote their shares on their behalf. This still made him accountable to those shareholders, and he had to honor those agreements. And each shareholder was able to limit the issues on which he would have majority voting power. The issue of dual-class share structures is very interesting. The amount of companies going public from Silicon Valley with a dual-class share structure has increased from 15% in 2012 to 46% in 2022. Interestingly though, most of the most successful companies like Amazon and Tesla don't have these share structures and their founders and executives remain accountable to the entire shareholding. No matter your view of dual-class share structures, it's obvious that Elizabeth Holmes was able to use it to maintain control of the board of directors at Theranos. This gave her the power to push forward with her vision of the company, weakened the corporate governance, and concentrated the power in her hands. Theranos may go down in history as one of the biggest corporate frauds, and Elizabeth Holmes' tactics for controlling the narrative around Theranos are very interesting to examine. They were varied and they were extensive, and many of them were based in fundamental legal strategies that many founders should actually be aware of. By curating her public image, controlling the media, using NDAs, and manipulating a dual-class share structure, she created a web of lies that lasted for years. It's a cautionary tale about the dangers of unchecked ambition and the importance of holding those in power accountable for their actions. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video informative. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more explanations of the legal side of the business world. And if you have suggestions for topics, feel free to leave them in the comments below.